Okay, I've just got one more question for a man, and then we thought we'd open up the floor to you guys for about five minutes. We we thought you might even have better questions than than we came up with. <laughs> um, and that question is: Did you did you really play all the instruments um, in there? I, and I wanted to clarify that. Yeah, there was only two instruments I didn't play, and that was the Ones Martineau, which was performed by uh, Thomas Bloke in France. We emailed you know FTP parts back and forth, uh, and then Kevin Kissinger, who plays theremin out of Kansas City. Land of the theremin. Um, and <laughs> he's amazing. I was looking for theremin players. I had lots of recommendations from different people. And then I finally went to Kevin's site. Someone recommended it to me. There is a site called Theremin World. Some of you are probably members, right? Uh, and I was listening to different things. And Kevin Kissinger did take me out to the ball game on the theremin. So with that kind of dexterity, OK, he can probably handle a melody by Ravel. So he was, he was totally turned on. We've yet to meet. I hope to meet him at NAMM one of these days. And so he, he did the theremin solo. And then, yeah, I, I worked on everything else with Steve Picara doing a couple of guest solos as well as Patrick Moraz. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much everybody. All right. So before we turn the questions over to you, I would just like to say a couple of thanks um, to Diana Dilworth, who we're partnering with tonight, to uh, Roland, to Roland for lending us the equipment here. I'd like to thank Mark Vale because he is the one who introduced um, Amin to me and showed me the whole timeline a couple years ago. And I looked at that timeline and I said to him, that looks like the Moog legacy to me. And you know, in saying that, it's again, the celebration of synthesis as a whole. Not, not just Bob Moog's work, but everything that came before and after it. And speaking of legacy, I guess one fact that we forgot to mention is originally the plan had been to have Bob do a narration track on this project. So we would have the great Bob Moog in a little square in the corner talking about you know, each of the synthesizers and the history of it. Mark kindly introduced me to Bob. And uh, pardon me? We kidnapped him. We took Bob to this awful Thai, Thai restaurant somewhere and talked about the idea. And he was very supportive. That was the same year his health was starting to fail. And uh, we tried to communicate. And then it became, it became difficult. And unfortunately, we lost Bob before we were able to do that. And so Mark came through uh, with the liner notes as the next best thing. And we felt it was fitting because the Bob Moog Foundation was just starting to emerge. Uh, a portion of every sale of the album goes to the Bob Moog Foundation. Uh, and to any and all artists here that are working, especially in any kind of celebration of this kind of synthesis and the kind of worlds that Bob, among many pioneers, created, uh, consider doing that. It's a really neat way of giving back. And it's a great way to also connect you to like-minded people, because it's the foundation that kind of connected me to all of these people, including now Diana and the Mellotron world that she's about to present. And uh, it's, it's an idea. It's an idea to think, uh, to think about. And, uh, and we're, I'm very honored to have been one of the first artists to do that. And uh, I think your dad would be pretty proud. OK, so I would like to open the floor up just to a couple questions. Does anyone have any questions for a man? Ooh, quiet crowd, low blood sugar. Just throw there money for the next album. Just okay. throw funding. That's fine. Teacher's Pat right here in the front row. Mitchell? <laughs> do you work for Apple, really? No. Oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, I agree with them about logic as you are. Yeah, well, there we go. OK. Um, bad aside. Since you did it over such a large period of time and used so many different, since you used uh, so many different instruments and did it over a long span of time, uh, how are you able to play everything? I don't know if I can ask this right. Um, with so many different parts, how did you put it all together in terms of okay, I'm going to record this section on this synth, and now I have to sync this up with something a year later? And Eric Persing, yeah. in a program called Atmosphere. The first version of Bolero was built on a power book in Los Angeles with a small keyboard when I was helping programming some, uh, some stuff for Steve Picaro, and I built most of it, first of all, on Atmosphere, which had some pretty good approximations with a lot of different technologies that I wanted. So yes, to find that instrument here, what was I going to put down here, I had other layers that kind of gave me an idea of the kinds of things. Made a template of the entire thing, tried some experiments and stuff like that, and Atmosphere really helped me get there. There were still some surprises along the way that changed it around. But yeah, it began with a very simple bed track, which was, which was loose enough that allowed me to be creative on top of it, but it also had enough structure and density so that I, I knew where I was going and where things would build. So thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Not Don Lewis, no. No questions from Don Lewis. <laughs> 
if, if you put it all in a row, I mean, if I were to do it again, I would have loved to just go into a cave somewhere for three months with all the gear, kiss my family goodbye, and just go for it. That would have been fun. Uh, the real world doesn't allow to do that. Um, I was working on a lot of different projects and stuff like that. So it was a span of about three to four years. Uh, and ironically, in one particular year, I was working on, an, on, a, you know, on a preschool children's show, which was paying me really good money, and it was a fun show to work on. And my kids were really happy I was working on it. And so I stopped working on the album for about a year. Uh, and coming back to it, two very sad things had happened. We had lost Bob Moog, but worse, Logic had changed its software yet again. <laughs> I hope that's okay. I did that as a joke. Um, so, th so there was time getting back into it. And for anybody who's contemplating large projects like this, you know, plead with your loved ones to say, please leave me alone for several weeks and just go and do it. Because if I, if I could do it all over again, getting back into the project every few months and trying to remember where I was and trying to get back into it, I wouldn't want to do that again. Um, the next album, which I've got ideas for, I'm already prepping my friends and family to say, okay, you know, for six weeks, you're not going to see me. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what it, but yeah, it was, it was about four years as far as the evolution of making it all come together. Thanks, Don. Yeah, one last question. When you used the uh, analog synths, did you CV to MIDI anything and sequence anything, or was everything played live? Uh, in some cases, I did MIDI to CV, uh, and it's interesting because uh, when I was using the spec when I was using Atmosphere as a guide, I thought, great, I can pre-play some of my parts, you know, so I can have this simulated version, you know, of uh, of an Art Pro soloist, for instance, because it has CV input. So I'll build my solo here, and then I'll save time at the Cantos Foundation and just, you know, do a MIDI to CV thing. Uh, and I had a Roland MPU 105, somebody. What if, thank you. There we go. Um, to, to simulate that. And I think on a couple of places that did come in handy, we tapped into Patrick Gleason's EMU modulator sy uh, modular system that was at the Cantos Foundation. And that was great because I wanted it to do something pretty rhythmic. And so some of the note values that I had already in the sequencer, those worked fine. Um, simulating an art pro soloist and playing an art pro soloist are, are two very different things. So there came a point where I was like, okay, screw all this CV MIDI stuff. And I just grabbed the thing and started to play. And that, yeah, that made a difference. So again, for early analog synthesis, the other underestimation that I made is there's just no match for that, that original thing and, and that original you know, performance. Uh, and I think in this day and age, uh, MIDI is a great language and we'll continue to use it and it's continued to be used in all forms. But it's interesting, with digital having come the way it is, I think we're going back into taking strange instruments and just playing them directly in. The idea of having this interim interface where you can you know, figure out everything beforehand and treat it like a word processor, I think we've lost something in there. And so now the idea is to come back and say, well, here's the instrument, here is the sound, here is the personality, and that gets recorded as opposed to keeping some interim version for it, which has served me well over the years. I mean, you know, many of us here are writing film scores and are trying out different things that you have to modify and change at the client's whim. And for that, MIDI has come in really handy. And my, my main studio has a whole MIDI arsenal of stuff. But when I get time off and get to do the real personal stuff, yeah, it's just, it's analog synths and tubes and strange things all just being recorded once and being done with it. We're going to bring up Diana Dilworth now, but we just wanted to point out that um, virtuality is for sale in the back table after the, after the documentary. So I'd like to introduce you to Diana Dilworth. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Amin.